namaste. So in the eight years that this channel has existed, no one yet has responded appropriately to this teaching. What do I mean by appropriately? <laughs> well, in order to fill out this answer to this question, I want to present to you the scope of this teaching. And hopefully, once you understand that, you'll be able to understand what it would mean to respond appropriately. So let's take a look at the whole field of spiritual development. We can represent that with a pyramid shape. Now a pyramid shape is wide at the bottom. That means there's a lot of people who are in the lower stages and it's narrow at the top, which means there are only a few people who actually reach the top, the pinnacle. And what are these stages? First, there's Dvaita which is sectarian religion, and that's karma yoga. The next stage is Vishishtadvaitavada, and that's where bhakti yoga is practiced. Then there's Vivartavada, and that's the realm of raja yoga practice. And finally, Ajatavada, and that's jnana yoga, or actual self-realization. So, in each of these stages, there are several groups. Like in the stage of Dvaitavada, there are many sectarian groups. Each one is claiming that we have the only truth, we have the best method of sadhana, only the people in our group are going to heaven or whatever. And they all fight with each other and put each other down and uh, try to be the exclusive purveyors of truth. Not only that, they lie. They say, for example, some people uh, or some groups say they are presenting bhakti, but they're presenting bhakti as a sectarian path. So is that real bhakti? No, it's actually karma yoga dressed up as bhakti. And even worse than that, you have some people saying they're presenting jnana, but they're presenting it as a sectarian religion. Oh boy, that's really messed up. And the same goes for Vivartavada too. For example, the Buddha's teaching now, which is a total Vivartavada teaching from the start, if you read the original teachings, is now presented as a sectarian religion. So they're dragging it down huh, from its original exalted position on the scale and making it a churchy kind of club, you know, and with lots of different sects and they all fight with each other and tear each other down. That doesn't happen in real Vivartavada. Doesn't even happen in real Bhakti. Let's take a look at Vishishtadvaitavada First of all, here's an indication that nobody is really paying attention. For the last year or so, I've been talking about these Chatur Darshana, the four views, and I was intentionally misspelling Vishishtadvaitavada, and nobody caught it. See, that means nobody is looking up the words in the Sanskrit dictionary, nobody is paying attention. Nobody is really learning this teaching. Uh, if this was a course, you would all flunk. Well, it is a course, and the exam is death. At the time of death, whatever you have realized will determine your destination in the next life. That's given in Bhagavad Gita 1313. Look, go look it up. So then, in the bhakti range, there are three circles. What does that mean? There are three main types of bhakti. And that is bhakti in the mode of passion, bhakti in the mode of ignorance, and bhakti in the mode of goodness. So once one moves beyond bhakti, 
one reaches Vivartavada, and that's the realm of meditation. And here, there's only one circle because really there's only one kind of meditation. <laughs> meditation is one. And uh, if you try to present a sectarian view on this, well, you're totally off. <laughs> You've totally lost it. And the real meditation is Tantra, the Kaula path, where the energy rises up the spinal channel through all the chakras until it reaches the crown, and then realization occurs. So that realization is known as a Jatavada, or Jnana Yoga, and at any one time there may be, I don't know, a few dozen people on that level, at most, probably less than that. And of those handful of people, one is going to be the current world teacher, the teacher who has the overall view of the whole path of religion and spiritual life. So what we have here is basically a view that transcends even the Chaturdarshanam. That is beyond even Ajatavada, because somebody in Ajatavada doesn't really care about all this. They're just enjoying their enlightenment. You know, but somebody who cares about the rest of the human race, even though they're enlightened, is going to take on a lot of trouble, a lot of difficulty to try to share this with others and teach it. And we live in a time, as I talked in the last video, where everything is upside down and backwards. So knowledge or enlightenment is seen as foolishness and ignorance. And ignorance and selfishness and venality and so on are seen as good qualities. So the people who go chasing money are seen as very, very high in the human society. And the people who are chasing power and violating every moral principle in the process are seen as very, very important people. Huh? while the people who live humble, simple lives, cultivating spiritual life, are neglected. And let me give you an example of that. Just a little while ago, on our private chat group, which is supposed to be all the advanced students, right? Someone insulted me, you know, very egregiously insulted me. They told me to chill out, venerable sir because I was chastising the group exactly the way I'm speaking now. Like, you haven't got it. You haven't really been following. You're just putting up appearances of being students. You're not really getting it, and so on. Now, if you're in a school and you're taking lessons from a teacher, the teacher has the right to discipline you isn't it? Isn't it the case in every school you've ever been in? The teacher has the right to impose discipline, to make rules and enforce them. So that's no different in spiritual life. In fact, it's even more so. Because here we're talking about the most important lesson that you can learn in human life, which is enlightenment. So if you miss this, or if you make offenses against it, as we talked about in the previous video. You can ruin your life. I mean, not only this life, but many lives to come. So if someone pretends to be a student but doesn't study, if someone pretends to be a disciple but won't accept discipline, if the students don't organize and correct themselves and in each other to prevent these offenses, they all go to hell. This is given in so many scriptures. You got to read them and understand them. So with that background, the appropriate response to a teaching on this level would be, oh my God, I'm going to drop everything, cash out all my assets, come to the teacher, be a disciple, in the classic sense, 
surrender to him as a guru, accept his discipline as mercy. See, We're, this is not politically correct bullshit liberalism. This is a traditional spiritual path and the guru has literally power of life and death over the disciples. For example, in the Zen tradition, there was one master, I forget his name right this second, but anyway, one student was in charge of ringing the bell to call the other disciples to meditation or class or whatever. Oh, Ryokan, Ryokan. Ryokan was standing behind the student, watching him. And while he was supposed to do his duty of ringing the bell, his attention got distracted by a beautiful woman. Ryokan hit him, swatted him so hard on the back with his staff that he collapsed and died. So if that happened today, Ryokan would wind up in jail, maybe even get executed. But in those days, the value of the guru was understood. Of course, it was accidental. He merely meant to chastise him, not kill him. But the point is, he had a right to do that. He had a right to chastise his students. He had a right to discipline his disciples. That's what disciple means. Someone who accepts discipline. So if you don't accept discipline from the teacher, you're not even a student, what to speak of a disciple. A disciple is somebody who surrenders everything. And history bears this out. My Adi Guru Srila Prabhupada was an intense disciplinarian. And he elevated many, many disciples to higher levels of being. Oh, and good old Ryokan, huh? 12 of his disciples attained the highest enlightenment and became Zen masters themselves. That's, I think that's the record. That's the greatest number of students that any Zen master brought to enlightenment. So his discipline had its effect. He was rightly feared by his disciples and respected properly by them. And because of that, they avoided the offenses that took the others down. So, if you want to follow this path, if you want to call yourself a student or a disciple of this teaching, you have to be willing to accept chastisement. Now, I have been speaking in chastising mood in the last few videos, and of course I've gotten a bunch of bullshit comments from stupid people who think I should be politically correct and always be nice and never say anything negative. Huh? That's bullshit. You know, if you're off, the teacher has a duty to correct you. It's kindness. He's going out of his way to help you. You know, so if you then criticize the teacher, you're simply creating another offense for which you're going to have to suffer. You're going to have to lose your spiritual standing. You're going to have to fall down. You're going to have to take rebirth in this awful fucked up place. We all want to get out of here, but nobody wants to pay the price. The price is you follow the teaching, you follow the teacher, you accept his discipline, and you do what he tells you to do. Oh, touch that.